Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Kate Campbell, welcome to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. It is good to be back, Owen, and we're talking about a topic that has really taken my fancy recently. What is this? <laughs> How you can use your money to like buy it. happiness. Okay. Can and, you do it? Well, we did it yesterday. We actually paid to do a fun run. I mean, you can run for free. You can run anywhere you want for free, but we actually paid to be part of a group fun run situation. But that was also a lot of pain. Well, for you, because you were the wrong runners. Yeah, brand new runners. Tip to anyone. If you're running 19Ks, don't wear brand new runners. I knew this, but I did it anyway. And it doesn't work. So, you don't go faster. In fact, you go a lot more painfully. Well, so. he hobbled to the finish line at the very end. Yep. And we got Actually, there. Actually, you know what? My fastest kilometer was my last one. Because I was like, hmm. end of the run. Leave nothing in the tank. Well, you knew I'd be watching. Yeah, that's just impress <laughs> you and all the family. You could not come through hobbling. Yep. So, um, okay. So, we're talking about can money buy you happiness? Yes. There and are so many yeah. opinions on this. To be honest, my initial thoughts were yes, but. And I think there's a lot of places where money can buy you happiness if you use it in the right way and money can make your life a lot easier. And the reason... I think this topic's really relevant to think about is that most of us are earning money, we're spending money, we're investing for our future, but it's also really good to think about the way we're spending money to make sure we're getting the most value out of it. Mm -hmm. And it was actually recently I read a paper called If Money Doesn't Make You Happy, Then You Probably Aren't Spending It Right by some academics in the US. And they brought together so many different studies from the last 20 years and put together about eight different ways that are scientifically backed that you can use your money in a way that adds extra happiness to your life. And some of these are very sort of self-explanatory, like you would already know them, but you might not necessarily actually do anything about them. Like we, we know that um, giving money and giving things to other people, whether it's our time, our energy, our money does make us feel better, but sometimes we forget about that. So some of these things, they might seem really straightforward to you, but it's actually good to rethink them. And we're going to talk a bit about an example or practical way to try each one in your life. So eight things that can maybe improve your happiness. Yes, that are scientifically backed. We'll leave you to read the research and I'll link the paper in the show notes, but we'll probably talk more about the practical side. But to quickly show you where we're going, uh, I'll just... There are outline eight the eight things. So the first one is buying more experiences and fewer material goods, mm -hmm. using your money to benefit others rather than yourselves, mm -hmm. buying many small pleasures rather than a few, a few large ones. Yep. Soy latte. <laughs> Go on. Um, getting rid of having too many extended warranties and other forms of overpriced insurance in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, delaying consumption. Yep. Considering how various features of your purchases might affect your day-to-day -day lives, because sometimes we buy things, but they have uh, a lot of extra obligations or they'll change the way we do things that we haven't really thought about. That was one that caught me off guard, actually. Yeah. So we'll have a look at that. Um, be wary of the way you go comparison shopping, because that often leads us into traps like analysis paralysis, and we end up, we try to get a better deal and we end up feeling very overwhelmed and we end up comparing mm. the wrong features of products and also paying closer attention to the happiness of others. And that looks at um, what your friends like and what they recommend and things like that. And I thought it'd be really good to look at some of the interesting aspects from each of these propositions that are put forward in this research report and maybe some examples of how we've tried them in our own lives and if they've worked, haven't worked, and maybe some practical examples because at the end of the day, the reason we're saving and investing and working on our finances is to live our lives on our own terms. 
and we're not just investing for the sake of it. So I think it's really important that you get to a point where you can, you have in the financial position where you can choose where you spend your time, money and energy. Yeah. A lot of people think that money can buy happiness, right? So we just end up buying more stuff and we think we'll be happy when or we'll be happy if we just got this thing. It's very, very easy trap to fall into. So um, like we look at a lot of people and we envy other people and we say, well, well, look at their house, look at their car, look at the holiday they've gone on um, and we try and catch up with them and we end up investing money. When I say investing, it's like the other type of investing where you invest money in things or products or services that maybe don't bring you any happiness or if they do, it's fleeting. So it comes and goes very quickly and it's not money well spent. Would that be fair? Yeah. Yeah, and I think the other thing is that money can also smooth your journey. So there's a lot of – money's not going to stop all the bad things in life happening. Mm -hmm. In fact, they still will happen, but it can make things a lot smoother. So like say the trains were cancelled and the next one's not for an hour. If you are in the financial position to do so, you could get an Uber home. Yeah. Rather than having to wait an extra hour in the cold at night time to go home. Yeah. So – that's actually an interesting thing. Like money maybe doesn't buy happiness, but it maybe reduces friction in your yeah. life. So it gives you, in doing so, it gives you more control. It gives you more choice, which maybe it's not necessarily, as the research might have it, uh, pointing out, like allowing you to achieve more happiness. Maybe it just lessens, as you said, the downside and so smooths your ride overall. Like, for example... I'm very fortunate that I am in a position. I caught the wrong tram home the other day. I just put my headphones in, looked down at my phone, looked up, and I was not in my suburb. And I yeah. was like, should have checked this sooner? And I was like, okay, I'll just catch an Uber back. But a lot yeah. of people wouldn't do that. They'd go back into the city and then go back out, right? Yeah. So little conveniences like that. Yeah, and it doesn't stop those challenges, but it does make them more manageable. And an interesting study they pointed out, now these are – all from the US, but they got respondents to keep a diary for 30 days and track daily events and their emotional responses. And the participants' income ranged from 10,000 to 150,000 or more, so quite a wide range of participants. Mm -hmm. And some of the key findings were that money reduces the intense stress. So it doesn't stop all the distressing, the inconvenient events from happening in life. Um, and no matter the income, people resp reported um, – a similar amount of these daily frustrations happening, mm -hmm. but those with the higher incomes experienced less negative intensity from those events. So they were able to use their money to deal with these problems a little bit more. Okay. Um, they also found that money brings greater control. So the people in the study with higher incomes felt more control over negative events and that control reduced their stress levels. So if for some reason something went wrong and they had to book a last minute flight, they had money in their emergency fund, let's say, to cover that so they didn't have to stress about where the money's coming from. Okay. And so people with more higher income, so this was more about incomes rather than how much they had saved, but it gave them more uh, control over dealing with situations that arose. Mm -hmm. And they also found that higher incomes lead to higher life satisfaction mm -hmm. um, and people with higher incomes were generally more satisfied with their lives. Okay. So it reduces intense stress. It helps you, it brings control through those choices and it just overall tends to lead to more satisfaction with life, which it makes sense, right? Yeah. Because a lot of studies do show that after a certain point, the effects of money do tend to wear thin. Mm. But if you just took the general population, you said, let's look at these things. This would, this is probably what would make sense, right? Um, I think it was Kahneman showed that after a certain point of income, the effects of these start to wear off. So that would be interesting too. Like what point do they start to fall away? I think they said up to $150,000. And then it's, this was a few years ago. Then those effects started to fall away. Because if you look at this, I think it like reduces intense stress. If you were earning, let's just say, for example, 150 grand, you could probably reduce a lot of the big stresses in your life. Mm. Um, like mortgage, groceries, That's those are the two big ones. I uh, would give you enough control. You could probably catch an Uber. Um, higher incomes lead to higher life satisfaction. You could probably just do a few more things as well. Yeah. And I think that's one of the important things that why we go on so much about having that emergency fund. It's when 
those things that life throws at you happen and they will happen. You have more control and more choices with how you deal with them. Mm. So for example, having a sick family member, you have the option to take some extra time off work without um, suffering severe financial stress. You can buy extra meals to support another loved one. You could um, take them on a, a trip or something like that. So it's not going to stop the bad thing from happening, but it can give you a lot more options and flexibility when it does. Mm. I think there'd be a bit of like sampling as well here. Like we'd just be mindful of the sampling bias that if you have a certain amount of income, you're probably in a situation where you have other things in your life that are going right. So you are probably in a situation uh, where you might have, for example, a family around you that have supported you to earn that amount of money and you might have a higher e educational level and these types of things. So they probably improve as you go up the wealth spectrum as well, which is another thing that will lead to life satisfaction as well. So there may maybe other influences, causation versus correlation, if you catch my drift. Yeah. Okay. So let's, Kate, let's just dive into each one of these things. Maybe we'll spend a few minutes on each one. Yep. And then we'll try and, for ourselves and for everyone that's listening to this, we'll try and help you take one or two things away so that you can hopefully improve your happiness as you earn. Yeah. Sound good? Sounds good. So the first one they put forward is that but you want to focus on buying more experiences and fewer material goods. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen this in your life where you really enjoy those experiences you have with friends and family. Maybe you go out to a concert um, or, or go on holiday and you remember this for years to come. Whereas if you spend a similar amount on a material good, maybe you brought a new blender instead of going out to the concert. Um you you might still enjoy using it and it adds mm. value to your life, but it's not necessarily going to give you as much happiness. So thinking of money as an opportunity for happiness and it's a good way to think about how much you allocate to experiences versus things in your life because you have the uh, memory dividends as well. That was a concept mentioned in Die With Zero by Bill Perkins, a book mm. I've, I've talked about before on the podcast. But you, from those experiences, the dividends, the memory dividends pay off for years to come because you talk about that event and you remember that event. And the research shows that the material goods we buy don't seem to have the same effect. Mm. Well, it makes sense, right? Uh, I think I mentioned one of the studies that was actually, so we're, we're quoting an author, uh, an academic Elizabeth Dunn here with this study. Um, she was the one that wrote the book Happy Money, which is the one that I always reference. Mm. And it's loaded with like a hundred academic resources at the back. So it's wonderful. But in that, they showed that there was one study that was done, which showed if you got a BMW and you drove through the hills in um, California, then they did it without the BMW and just had some old bomb. And it was showed that, it was proven that it wasn't actually the BMW that brought happiness. It was the drive through the hills with friends. Yeah. And so it's, it makes a lot of sense. And I remember like going overseas, I just remember that the thought of it brings me happiness. Yeah. You know, like the thought of when I was in Vietnam and the wonderful food or in Japan and going snowboarding, like these things are just, I'll carry them with me, you know? Yeah. And they, they found that the material goods, they bring us happiness when we use them, but not so much when we think about them. So if you brought a new bag, you don't usually like just think about that bag all the time and go, oh yeah, that's so great. Yeah. But you, if you're using the bag, then you might really feel happy about your purchase. So it's a little bit different. Um, Can we actually jump then? Yeah. I'm going to jump ahead, Kate. Can we jump to then the insurance one? Because you just mentioned something which I think is really important. So this was number four on our list, but mm -hmm. you mentioned that when you buy something, right? When you buy something, you feel really good. But then when the, the memory of it is not as good. So when you buy a new TV, right? But then you don't remember back, oh, geez, I remember standing in JB Hi-Fi. It was so much fun and, you know, buying <laughs> yeah. that TV. But then this is psychology working against you right here. So at this moment, once you've bought this thing, you've bought this 65-inch plasma TV or whatever you want, it's at this moment when your happiness is high and you can get sucked into insurance. Yeah. So there's a lot of insurances that we probably do need in our lives and we've talked about some like the ones you might have in your superannuation but there's a lot of times when insurances are usually more beneficial f to the product manufacturer than they are to you mm. and so things like when you're in JB Hi-Fi or the Apple store and you're paying for those Apple insurances yep. um so for example I bought a, a fridge recently and it was maybe $500 and I had the opportunity to extend the warranty by a year or two for an extra hundred dollars. So that's adding 20% to the purchase yeah, well. price for an extra, I think it was one or two years of warranty. 
Right. And so you're really having to weigh up. In that moment, they're saying, well, this is going to be so great. You're already buying this fridge. They're weighing on the fact that you're already paying $500. Mm. Uh, but really, in the reality, are you going to need that insurance? Maybe, maybe not. Is it likely that the fridge will actually break down in five or six years' time and you won't get to take advantage of it anyway? Yeah, the thing is here, right, because you're currently experiencing a moment of joy and happiness because yeah. you've just bought this thing. But then you think about, as the studies show, you think about the fear of losing that thing while you're happiest about it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, like, you you think, I great, I've got this new fridge, but if I don't get this insurance, I might lose my fridge, which I'm so happy about right now. And so, that's when you are most vulnerable to this sales tactic. Yeah, we're using money to sort of protect ourselves from future emotional distress in yeah. the fact that our fridge might break down. And we do this a lot. We do this with so many different things. Like we avoid, like the fear of something is often worse than the fear, like the thing actually happening. And we see this with like budgeting, right? We've talked about this a few a few weeks ago, a few months ago, how the fear of not saving enough is more scary than the actual pleasure you get from saving more and all these different things. So it's at this moment when you're most vulnerable. So I think this is a this is a really interesting thing. Like they say, avoid these overpriced insurances. Obviously, there are some which you said are essential. Yeah. So we're not saying go out and drive without insurance because that's probably a bad thing. It's also a, a legal requirement yeah. in Australia. So yeah. keep that in mind. And this tip, if you read into it a little bit more, it also talks about the opposite way. When a company says you have 180-day change of mind policies, so in some of the newer mm. um, companies like bed. The Bed, they actually found some research that this actually leads to a little bit less happiness because you have, especially if it's front of mind, that I have 180 days to decide if I like this and want to change my mind, then you haven't committed to that purchase sometimes and you keep thinking, should I send it back? Should I keep it? Should I send it back? And so you don't fully enjoy the purchase because you're still trying to decide whether you want to return it. So sometimes really generous return policies that are uh, pushed in your face can actually lead to a reduction in happiness as well. Because you think... I've bought, there's also this commitment and consistency bias, which is from Cialdini, which is that once you've bought it, you have to like it because you've bought it. It's a sunk cost. Like yeah. You've paid for it. You have to enjoy it. But if you have the choice, maybe it you know, works the other way. But from a, consume, uh, from a manufacturer's, from a business's perspective, offering this is actually quite low risk. Yeah. Because if you get a mattress, you pull it out of the box, you know, it's one of those like koala mattresses or whatever, you pull it out of the box, it's like, are you going to change it? They know you're not. Like most people aren't going to be yeah. like, yeah, I'm going to take back this mattress um, even though I have that time. So that's that's really interesting. So we've got that working against us. So we have two types of happiness. We've got the when it's purchased and then the ongoing benefit. Let's jump back. So that was number four. Yes. Let's jump back to number two. Yes. So number two is using your money to benefit others rather than yourselves. Mm -hmm. And so this is – so using money to buy things for ourselves can be – sometimes antisocial because we're just thinking about ourselves, but you can actually gain a lot of happiness if you're thinking about how can I spend my money on my friends and family donating to charity because that actually brings us a huge amount of joy. This is the one with the mole rats. Oh, yes, the yes. mole rats. <laughs> so only three animals, termites, I'm not going to even say that, you social insects and naked mole rats construct social networks as complex as ours. And we're the only one with whose complex social networks include unrelated individuals. So we're not related to Joe Bloggs down the street, but we still have connection. Mm. You know, we can go to a business and we have a connection with a human. It's really interesting. Um, and it says, many scientists believe that this hyper-sociality is what caused our brains to triple in size in just 2 million years. Mm. Fascinating. So we have a connection to people that we don't even know about. And so there is a relationship that we form, right? Yes. And we can use money in a way to improve our connections with those in the community because whether you're uh, taking a friend out for lunch, often you get a lot more joy if you're shouting the lunch rather mm. than splitting down to the last dollar at the end of the lunch. And so if you're, you might get a lot more joy being able to shout a friend a coffee and swap each time rather than splitting every single time because then it feels much more like a transaction than a relationship. Yeah, that's actually interesting. So, um I think that's that's really important too. Like I hate going out and then someone's like calculating like how much they spent. It's just like, yeah, here's a hundred bucks. Um, and just forget about that kind of point of friction in a relationship and just 
enjoy the experience. Don't think about all those little things around the outside. Just enjoy being there with that person. I think it's really important. Yeah. One of the, um, it was from a different research study, but I was listening to it on a podcast was saying the, they looked into the Venmo culture in the US. So mm. in Australia, it's like beam it or it's a way you can split bills mm. and pay your friends. And it was making people a lot more transactional in the fact they were had to pay the person $38.55 for their half of the meal. And it was actually leading to a drop in satisfaction from that overall experience because people were paying each other down to the last cent. So it felt much more like a business transaction because normally when we had cash and we paid our friends back, we might round down or round up a few dollars because we're like, oh, here's 50 or mm. here's 30 from the meal. We wouldn't be going to the exact cent. And so uh, the more exact you make it, that it also leads to a decrease in happiness. Mm. Interesting. And I remember, I, I'm sure you can remember things like this happening too, where people will be very like devil in the details when they look at that invoice or the, so the receipt. They're like, well, I paid for this. That's this. That's it. Just move on. Yeah. <laughs> Just move on. Split it and move on. Yeah. And you can use money paper, to, to increase those relationships. So whether it's giving gifts to people Mm -hmm. with no expectation of anything in return or taking a friend out for lunch. That deepens that relationship beyond a, a transactional basis, especially um, because that leads to the expectation there'll be something else in the future. There'll mm -hmm. be another event where you shout them lunch and things like that. So thinking about different ways that I, I think it's good to reflect on how you feel when you're buying gifts um, for loved ones, even surprise gifts. I yep. mean, I love um, surprising people with a gift when it's just not their birthday or anything. It's just like you thought of them in this completely unrelated event and then you got them something and just surprised them. Yeah. yeah Cause that great. really deepens that connection as well. And so thinking about how you feel when you buy gifts for loved ones, how you feel when you donate money to organizations, um, it's, we talk a bit about donating money, but there's also something quite different if you donate money on the spot. So whether you're buying a poppy for remembrance day or you're, Giving a, buying a raffle ticket from a local organization or buying one of those sausage sizzles, it's quite a different feeling to just making a $100 donation to an organization overseas on the internet. Yeah. It's plenty of studies show that uh, when you see the impact of it, it's um, you're more likely to give. Yeah. So, you know, we were talking about this yesterday after the run about you can when you're at an event like that where it's for charity, yeah. you can see it and you just want to give more. You want to volunteer. You want to give support in whatever way you can. Whereas if you're just, you know, 5,000 kilometers away and you're donating to it, you wouldn't really feel the same connection. So Yeah. And I think it's it's ways to create ties with those around you and in your community. Like we saw heaps of volunteers yesterday as well, and they were having a great time and they felt part of the community in the event because they were donating their time. Mm. Um, and just maybe just spend some time thinking about how you can use your money to support others and your loved ones this week and maybe pick one or two things. Maybe you pay a coffee forward at your local cafe. Uh, you don't necessarily know who it's going to, but see how that makes you feel and see if that, mm. because that also adds novelty and that's another way money can be used to buy happiness because we adapt to things in our lives so quickly. So if you can mix things up and spend money in a way you have not spent it before. So try paying a coffee forward this week and seeing, oh, did that, did that stay with me for the rest of the day? Did that give me a little boost of happiness compared to just that $5 I spend on a coffee every single morning mindlessly. I like it. Uh, number three is buy many small pleasures rather than a few large ones, which is going to anger everyone that thinks that cup <laughs> of coffee costs you $5. That's yeah. $40 when you retire or something like this. So many small pleasures over a few big ones. Controversial. Yeah. I might read this paragraph from the report because it kind of stuck with me. Um, but they said, adaption is a little bit like death. We fear it, fight it, and sometimes forestall it, but in the end, we always lose. And like death, there may be benefits to accepting its inevitability. If we inevitably adapt to the greatest delights that money can buy, then it may be better to indulge in a variety of frequent small pleasures, double lattes, pedicures, high thread count socks, uh, rather than pouring money into large purchases such as sports cars, dream vacations, and front row tickets. And so. they... Their argument is that um, small frequent pleasures can beat infrequent ones because we're less likely to adapt to the former. And the more easily we understand and explain something, the quicker we adapt to it. So um, we can delay adaption by changing things up. 
Mm. So, yeah, this would be interesting because I think there'll be a lot of people that say, well, my overseas holidays were the best experiences I've ever had. And whereas other people say, well, those little things I do every day are the things that bring mm. me joy. But I'd probably argue with the overseas holidays that you're doing, you're spending money on so many small things throughout the holiday that are novel. You're spending on a brand new food you've never tried before. So mm -hmm. you're spending a lot of, yes, you've got the huge big ticket item like the tickets and the accommodation, but you have so many novel experiences stuffed into three weeks that that's what makes it really memorable and happy for you. Mm. I like it. And they were saying some of the ways you can uh, increase your happiness with your spending here is changing up some of the variables. So novelty is an important one. So spending money in a way you haven't before. So spending money on a new type of entertainment or a new event or trying a new food, that's likely to bring more happiness per dollar than just going to the same lunch place you go every day. Uh, even surprise. Surprise is another variable. So surprising a loved one, then mm -hmm. surprising you back, that's probably going to bring you a lot more excitement per dollar. Uh, uncertainty when you when you go to an event and you don't really know what the result's going to be you're not you have never seen this performer or you try a new uh, art show or you try a new sport activity you might not like it you might like it but it also changes up things and also variability so um not doing the same thing with your money all the time so that's a way you can sp say you're spending fifty dollars on going out every week is there a way you can spend that fifty dollars to increase the happiness well the scientists would argue, yes, by spending that $50 in a different way every single week rather than at the same place, mm. you're likely to have more memories and more experiences from that. I agree that you would have more memories, more experiences. But I'd also say that um, some people go in search of those experiences to their detriment. Mm. So there's that old um, argument that why would I go to another restaurant when I know this one is so good? Mm. So there's like a there's the, the search cost, so the, the cost of finding the place, yeah. but then there's also the cost of mistakes that come along the way. And those experiences may not be pleasurable. So there's like a trade But they'll be memorable. They'll be, they may be memorable. Um, you may get food poisoning <laughs> if you end up at the wrong place. Um, but but yeah. So people will argue both ways for this point, which I think is really valid. So we used to work with Sophie and Sophie being our designer, early in the RAS days, she was a huge advocate for somewhere different every single time. And I'm kind of a bit of a homebody in many respects. So for me, it was like, no, I like this place. And this is where I, this is my comfort zone. Like I like to go to the same cafes that I know are really nice. Yeah. Well, we have coffee most of the time, 80% yeah. of the time at the same cafes and maybe once a week we'll, we'll change Try, it up. Just go wandering. Yeah. And so that's probably, for me, that's probably the right mix. I don't know about you, but I feel like that's a happy medium. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's just that's saying it's not all or nothing. It's not every single thing has to be different every single time. But it's just thinking about. I always like to think of life as a one big experiment, and I talk about that in the careers course as well. Is just trying new things. Like this might not work for you. They're just. It's based off research studies. It's based off average mm -hmm. numbers. So it doesn't necessarily apply to you. But maybe try one thing this week. One thing that you know you always spend money on whether that's food or entertainment, and just try to mix it up for this week and see okay. how that makes you feel. All right. I'm going to try a different cafe one day before work. And also try, like, if you're weighing up spending money on a larger purchase, is there a way you could try splitting that same amount into three or four smaller purchases and see how that makes you feel overall? Just like one larger purchase, it might be one night in a hotel versus a few more nights or a few different activities, maybe a massage and maybe a walking tour that you can get for the price of one night in the hotel. So maybe try weighing up those things and just experiment. It might work, it might not. I think the most powerful thing that most people do in this regard is they just try to understand where their happiness comes from. Yeah. Just the act of actually sitting down and go, hey, I spent all this money on this stuff. Um, maybe I should try something different. And just actually that, it's, it's just so powerful. It's mm. like illuminating how it changes the way you kind of spend your time and your money and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. Okay, number five is delaying consumption. We've said on the show, my favorite line is, if you drool, it tastes better. So, delaying consumption is one of these eight kind of principles that these academics have come up with as ways to maximize happiness from money. Yes. Why is this important? Well, firstly, it's good for your spending behavior that you're not going to buy now pay later no services and yep. you're actually saving up. So, um, 
what they actually find, especially with experiences, is the anticipation of the event is often, if not better than the actual event itself. And we get so used to having, if we want to watch a movie, we have it access right now for a new song right now. And there's actually a lot of research that shows waiting the week to watch the next episode of the TV show or waiting to see a concert a year out. Like I booked Ed Sheeran tickets a year out. And so there's a lot of like talk about it and, oh, what songs will there be? And what are we going to do beforehand? Like you get a lot of joy from the anticipation of the event over just spending that money. And so the research shows that if you can save up or even just pay for the event in advance, that's going to bring you a lot more joy. When you say event, it doesn't have to be like a concert or something. We're talking about event meeting. <laughs> spending money. Yes. So um, whatever it is, saving up. So if you want to buy a new laptop, saving up in a dedicated account for months and seeing that money go aside and knowing that you're working towards that and getting to the point where you can go and buy that laptop uh, in money you've saved, that's going to bring you a lot more happiness long term that you were able to progressively work towards that goal. Yeah. we. Uh, this is So Afterpay and all these buy now, pay later things, play into this intellectual laziness like instant gratification it plays into that and it allows you to think that you can juice your happiness right now with this purchase right Mm. now and it's the same with um like consumerism and fast fashion as well so buying a dress that you can buy now cheap and then you just throw it out because it's so cheap who cares Mm. you know there's a whole issue around sustainability and everything that, that goes with that but you can have it you can have it right now so, you know, it's about kind of unwinding that bias a bit. Um, and sure, there may be, ha- you can have some of those guilty pleasures and they shouldn't be, I guess the point is they shouldn't be guilty if they're pleasures, but um, you can have those things that you do spend yeah. money on. But some of the things require this. And I think I'd, I'd say that experiences, to your example with Ed Sheeran, is a good example of this. Uh, I don't think you're really going to sit down for too long and think, oh, geez, that plasma tv on my wall is going to look i mean you do that sometimes like yeah. I, I did that one i think it, it does work a lot better with experiences but anticipation is a great hack for happiness it's not necessarily something you're going to spend money on but let's say you force yourself to wait a week between watching an episode of your favorite tv show even though all the episodes are there because you get to think about it and talk about it if you can find a friend who will commit to waiting a week between each episode as well that's actually going to be great maybe even um, going without something for 30 days. Like I've done multiple challenges with different things. No TV. No no bread for 30 days, no TV for 30 days. And it does make it a lot more enjoyable. And you also change your patterns because like say when I didn't have bread for 30 days, suddenly I started ordering different things and that added a bit of novelty. Why no bread? Just because I I love bread so much, I didn't know if I could go a day without having a piece of bread. So um, I went for it. Last year, I did 30 days, no bread. I'm sure I told you about this. Anyway, um, but I ordered a lot of new things. So it added novelty to my life. And when I did no TV for 30 days, I tried new podcasts and I talked Mm. to different people and I pushed myself to do some different things um, because I didn't have that. So trying different challenges. Maybe you go a weekend with no phone, like just adding a little bit of anticipation in your life. And then when you go back to those things, they feel pretty good Mm. still after. Question, not to play in this too much. (laughs) What is your favorite type of bread? Oh, just anything from a good baker, like a multi-grain loaf. That's pretty good. What do you just bread eat? roll, a do baguette, you put like butter on it? Or like yes, toast. Toasted. Butter, toast. Yes. Amazing. Interesting. But that is not you cannot eat bread as hundred percent of a well balanced diet. <laughs> I have discovered that. It does not lead to great results, so I would not recommend. We do have an episode on nutrition that does recommend eating more than just bread. So it would recommend that. <laughs> but I guess as a practical takeaway, since it's not a bread podcast, though I wish. Darn. Um Think of ways you can add anticipation in your life, whether it's something you already do, maybe you can have a break from something for a while, Uh, maybe if there's an event you and your friend want to go to, you set a savings goal together and keep each other on track and you can plan up for that trip. So it's better to Mm. plan for that trip and save for that trip rather than having something spontaneous, Uh, says the research. Yeah, and this is, um, again, we've done this uh, when we talked about the 10 things activity um, creating a vision board and just really maybe if you just take a moment like we talk a lot about uh, being grateful and that's something that you can practice in the morning or the evening where you maybe just list down three things you're grateful for or one thing you're grateful for 
And by doing that, you kind of reorient your thinking towards what's something that I was grateful for mm. today. And then you can look forward to it tomorrow. So say, for example, it is a coffee. So we're talking about delayed gratification. But say you like coffee. Instead of going by four coffees today, you might say, I really enjoyed my morning coffee before work or my walk to work. You can, if you write that down, you just reflect on it. You can look forward to it the next day. And mm. that's delayed gratification with a shorter feedback loop. Also, if you do, if you are a baker and you make bread, please send us some of your wonderful bread. We will happily try that and give you a shout out on the podcast. <laughs> uh, number six, Kate, is this is the one that really caught me by, like it caught yeah. me off guard, which is consider how the extra things that come with whatever it is that you're spending money on affect your life. Yeah. So, so I think a yeah. good example is thinking about you might be dreaming of owning a house, mm -hmm. but you're not dreaming about all of the stuff that comes along with owning the house. Maintenance, like, mowing the lawn. Yes, taps falling off. Mortgage repayments. Fridge breaking down. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that go alongside that purchase. We're, I'm picking a really big extreme purchase here, but this applies to lots of different things that go along with it that might not actually make you so happy. So sometimes we get caught up in the goal and we don't think about all the things that are attached to that. And so the grass is always greener on the other side. There's always mm -hmm. going to be pros and cons to everything. One purchase will have downsides as well as upsides. But I think it's important to, when we're thinking about where we spend money, think about the full picture and not just get caught on that, the shiny part of it. So you, you might be thinking like, what are the things that go into this? Yeah. Probably the big purchase things would be like, what are the ongoing costs? Mm. So my time and my finances. Yeah. A boat's a big thing. A boat. Like people get obsessed with the idea the boats, of but we brought this up before. <laughs> a boat, but they forget the maintenance and like the harbour storage costs and the cleaning and the petrol and all of that sort of stuff that goes along with it. Getting rid of the barnacles. Yeah. All that stuff. Yeah. I don't, I, when I think of boat, I think of like a tinny, like a little boat. I think you're talking like Harbour storage, you're talking barnacles, you're talking <laughs> a boat that lives in the water. That's a big deal. Your, your boat just goes on the top of your car. <laughs> My boat just flips on top and away she goes. Yeah. Yeah. She'll be right. And yeah. we also, because when we're thinking about things in the future, we think about them quite differently. So we, we have a bit more imagination yeah, when it do, comes yeah. to them. So, um, and we can often build up a particular purchase or experience in our brain. I, I don't know if you've had it, the thought pattern, I'll be happier when oh, for sure. I do X, Y, Z, or I'll be happier when I change to this job, or I'll be happier when I finish my degree. And Move you never, to this location. Yeah. yeah and yeah, you're never really know. fully present in that single moment because you're always thinking about, I'll be happier when this happens. So, um, Fire community is a big one. Yeah. Yeah. So just thinking, how can I maybe reframe this purchase or this future experience or this future expectation into how can I actually enjoy it now? Um, and sort of thinking about those goals and those purchases in the the full picture, because that might stop you delaying, delaying, delaying. Yeah. Well, well it, there's multiple ways to how you define happiness, but one of the things would be the journey. Right, yeah. like that's a big part on where you're going is the journey, the day to day. So, um, yeah, I don't think yeah. happiness should ever be that end destination. It should be something you find along the way, mm. and you don't want to put off happiness until you do X Y Z. Yeah, or you it, buy X Y Z. Was it Dave from Strong Money that we're talking about yesterday? A fire, big fire advocate, um, mm. yeah, wonderful educator as well. Um, is that if you do, if you are planning like your finances, like I'm going to get to a million dollars, I'm going to get to this. Well, what actually, what you're doing is you're actually kind of like you're trying to speed up your life. Yeah. Which, when you think about it, if you're trying to get as fast as you can to something, you're actually in that time, you're going to, your life is going to be changing as well. So you don't want to rapidly go forward 20 years and have that amount of money. You want to enjoy it between now and 20 years. Yeah. And I think that's sometimes the trap we can get into when we are thinking long-term about our finances and maybe in 10 or 20 years, we'll be financially secure and we can do X, Y, and Z things. We're actually not thinking about how we can enjoy life now. And we don't want to be racing along the next 20 years until we get to this arbitrary financial goal. So it's thinking about how you can structure your life to enjoy things in the present while still looking after future you. Mm. Canstar and Finder are either going to love or hate you for this next one, which is beware of comparison shopping. Now, I actually think this might work for them because I think it mm. might, the time saved might actually increase your happiness. But this is another one that I wasn't expecting when you come up with these and you reference the research. Beware of comparison shopping. 
Now, this relates to us because when we talk about brokers and ETFs, but it yeah. is everywhere in our life. Yeah, so they point out that too much comparison shopping can sometimes lead you to comparing the wrong attributes because you might be looking for a product to suit XYZ need in your life or fill a certain problem. But when you get stuck on the comparison websites, they might be comparing using completely different attributes. So they might be comparing um, on category A, B and C and you're looking for something for D, category D. And so if you get stuck in all these comparison sites and reading other people's reviews, you might end up buying a product that is great in that category, but doesn't solve the problem you were trying to fill mm. in the first place. And so sometimes you can get distracted by the attributes that particular websites and the public are saying are good and forget what you actually wanted to buy. Yeah. So this could happen if we use the uh, investing example, we see this with brokerage accounts all the time. People write into us, which broker should I choose? I'm looking at this. I mean, and they, some of them have been looking for a month and they're thinking about it before they actually do anything. If you go with Comsec, Perla, Stake, uh, I can't remember who else I'm thinking of, uh, Self-Wealth, if you just go with one of these, you'll be right. You know, you're fine. Yeah, uh, but if you spent a long time looking at different websites and comparing brokers, then you might go, oh, but then this broker lets me buy international shares and this broker lets me buy this particular investment product. And then you might end up going down a track. All you wanted to do in the first place was buy an ETF and suddenly you're yeah. Picking a broker because they have a Hong Kong Stock Exchange or something that you were never looking for in the first place. And so you end up with a product that could be great in that category, but you're comparing it based off attributes that weren't actually mm. important when all you wanted to do was have a broker that made it easy for you to buy an ETF. Yeah. So analysis, uh, paralysis by analysis is something that we see in, in finance all the time. Mm. And that's because we're trying to reach this ideal end state. And if you go for ideal... Sometimes good enough is good enough. So sometimes it just pays to get going. Yeah. Um, that's just something that I try and do too. I don't, like, there are two different types of decision makers, right? If there's like on the shelf, like there's like SPC baked beans, Heinz, and then there's like five other brands, a lot of people just, just go whatever, the cheapest one, because um, they, they identify the variables that are important to them. And the rest of it kind of doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, and I usually just go for, out of principle to the middle one. Like not the cheapest one and not the most expensive one. Oh, I just really? like go to the middle. That's some kind of my rule of thumb. I do like SPC baked beans, like the flavor. So mm. I typically just cop it, even if it's a bit higher or whatever. Um, but there are many. That's why brands exist, right? Brands exist to try and make us have make a decision, yeah, and have loyalty to something, even if there's really no difference. Um, so that's a whole different type of psychology in itself, which we can get into another time. But um, just beware of comparison shopping. And Kate, number seven, uh, sorry, number eight is the final one in this list. And this is another one which you probably don't think about because it's like an indirect, I guess, benefit of the way you spend yeah. and how you decide to allocate your money. So it's pay close attention to the happiness of others. Yeah. So really looking at what makes other people happy and what brings them joy and they they point out in the report that research suggests that the best way to predict how much we'll enjoy an experience is to see how much someone else enjoyed it. Other people can supply us with a valuable source of data, not only by telling us what made them happy, but also providing information about what they think will make us happy. And I think this comes up a lot when people recommend shows to you because they know a little bit about you and your preferences and what you like. And they'll go, oh, I saw this. I think you'll love it. And then not only... If you then go and see that show that they recommended, not only are you hopefully having an experience that's sort of semi-tailored to you based off someone who knows you, you're also then having that shared experience because you can then go and talk about that experience and have that together. I think it was like with some of the TV shows when they were re released one per week and you're watching it with other people and then you get to chat about mm. it. It's having those shared experiences as well, whether it's a restaurant or reading the same book or things like that. It's... It's good to give recommendations and also listen to other people's as well. Yeah, I remember, for those of us that are old enough to remember, I don't think we're that old, but um, Game of Thrones, when it was only available on Foxtel, was like the only place you could get it. And it was the zeitgeist of society, at least in Melbourne in winter. It was like, if you're in an elevator stuck with someone, don't ask them how their day is. Like, ask them what they thought of the latest episode of Game of Thrones. Yeah. And... Uh, 
that was really cool because you could be in on that massive in joke or that massive in kind of like cultural phenomenon at the time. And uh, this is really important. But I got to say, like sometimes I get recommendations for restaurants or cafes and I'm a bit of a snob. And so sometimes like if someone else is like, you should check this place out, I'm like, "Mm, skeptical Skeptical fox is what I am. Like I'm just looking. At, mm, will it? And you got to you got to judge the source a little bit. Yeah. But well, like it's a it's a hack. It's a shortcut, right? Like yeah. If you like a particular type of bread, then I'm and and you find it really good. I'm probably going to try it because I know that you're like, you know, you like yeah. bread. And, and at like, least you get that shared experience. And yeah. I think sometimes we can get really caught up with just looking at online reviews and not actually asking people in our lives what's your recommendation for a plumber or a mm. bakery or a restaurant or a show or something like that? And there we miss out on a whole world of like tailored recommendations, but also that shared experience of trying someone's recommendation. Mm. And also there's a lot of movies online that might have really bad reviews, but you actually like, and you don't want to let that stop you having that enjoyable experience. Yeah, I like it. So just upon reflection. Upon reflection, what does this all mean to you? <laughs> what does it all mean? <laughs> You can improve your happiness by being mindful with how you're spending money. Yes. I think it all comes back to intention and the way you treat each dollar and what you do with it because there's ways you can slightly maximize your happiness. You're not going to be happy all the time. Nothing's going to really solve that. But you can use money to smooth things over. You can use money to build connections. You can build use money to build relationships, try new things, add novelty to your life. So... Just think of it like one big experiment and mm. give one of these things a go. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But it's worth a go if yeah. you're going to spend the money anyway. I like it. So just, then, uh, yeah, you hit the nail on the head there by just saying, like being happy with money is about intention and just being deliberate. Mm. So just from the academics, the, the list of eight things were buy more experiences and fewer material goods, which we've spoken about. Use your money to benefit others rather than just yourself. Buy many small pleasures rather than a few big ones. And that's, you know, that's both are good. Um, I try and avoid those extended warranties and overpriced insurance. Like unless you have some sort of insight on them, maybe it's not worth it. And maybe don't even buy it at the point of sale. Maybe you just get it later or something like that. Delay consumption where you can. So anti buy now, pay later. Consider how the thing that you're purchasing or the thing that you're investing in or spending money on, how does that impact other parts of your life and what does it bring with it costs you know time what does it bring with it sometimes those are good things number seven beware comparison shopping to the extent that it really just like draws you down and you just oh it's too much and finally use the people around you see what makes them happy to try and let some of that influence you the way you spend and the way you are mindful with your time and your money Mm. and that's it Yeah. And I think it's a really good exercise every so often to sit down and go, where did I spend my money this week? And which expenses actually brought more joy to my life? Did that coffee make me happier because it was in the morning and it was with friends versus the one I just got by myself after lunch? Mm. Like we use coffee a lot as just an example because people- We're in Melbourne. Yeah, we're in Melbourne. (laughs) But yeah, go through each of those purchases and kind of maybe give it a rating out of 10 and just figure out- how much did that add to my life and how much or didn't it add to my life? Did it detract from my life because that purchase came with lots of other obligations? And so, yeah, just every so often reflect on your spending and see, is there a way I could change it up a little bit or make it more in line with who I want to be? Yeah. I really like this episode, Kate. I think it's one of the best we've done in quite a long while. I really like this conversation about... um, the different ways that we can use money to help us. So Yeah, and I think this is also another good topic that if you haven't talked to friends or family about money before, this is also maybe a potentially fun starter topic uh, rather than diving into ETFs and investing and all of that stuff. So most people will have an opinion at the outset and you could ask them, when have you spent money that added to your life or took away from your life and get different examples from your friends and family. And I think this would be a good starting board as well. Yeah. If you really enjoyed this episode, please share it with some friends that I think that'd be a really great way to break down some barriers and stereotypes about money and how you can maybe improve their happiness. Like we've all got that one friend in our life that earns a really good wage and they don't spend mindfully. So maybe share this with them, share on social media, tag us in it. We'd love to share it. And, um, Yeah, Kate, I think you've done a great job with the prep for this episode. I think 
we need to read more studies like this. And we need to get Elizabeth Dunn on the show. Yeah, yeah. I Her research has <laughs> brought up so much on this podcast. I've read a, a lot of um, legal studies, but not many finance studies recently. So I'll link the full study. It's quite long in the show notes, but if you're into the research and really want to dive in, and also you can read her book. Yep. Um, and I've got a few other resources I found along the journey. I'll put them all in the show notes. So if this interests you, and if you want to read the paper, if money doesn't make you happy, then you probably aren't spending it right. It's all in the show notes for you. Cool. Kate, let's go get some bread. Thanks for joining me on this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. Thanks for listening, everyone.